Why is it that so many people in the Western world have rejected the God of the Bible? Discover the lost path to the Roman road today on Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Welcome to Season 2 of Creation Magazine Live. If you've missed Season 1, there's 24 one-hour episodes that uh, are available on creation.com. You can go to creation.com and view all of the episodes there. And this is the first episode in Season 2, 24 more half-hour episodes. Welcome. In this, in this episode, we're going to be t starting off with the lost path to the Roman road. Right. Lost Path to the Roman Road, kind of a basic uh, walkthrough of the, salvation, of the road to salvation. Right. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 13, 44, that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. Right. And that's going to be the verse that we use as a springboard. There is a treasure to be had by everyone today. Mm -hmm. uh, if you believe in Christ, there is a treasure for eternity in heaven. That's right. Even Moses, the prince of Egypt, right, considered the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt. We read that in Hebrews eleven six. Because Moses was, you know, looking forward to uh, eternal treasure, treasure yes. in heaven. Yes. He knew that uh, that was more important than what he could get from, from Pharaoh. And so this, this free gift of salvation that's offered by God, um, that's the most precious gift that any human being could get, you know. So finding this path to salvation, that would be like finding the ultimate treasure. And so if we can think of um, uh, the Roman road, you know, many Christians will be familiar with this this you know, phrase the Roman road, because it's, it's basically some, some scripture from the book of Romans. Yeah, Paul outlines the basic steps to be saved, to have our right. sins forgiven, and to achieve that treasure in right. heaven. And That's so right. tracks will often have this. It's been, you know, commonly called the Roman road. So let's take a look at our treasure map here, okay? We've got a, a scrap of paper, and it's got these X's on it, these, these different marker points. And, and let's go through uh, this. We'll, we'll zoom in on the, uh, the first marker here. And uh, that's Romans 3.23. And Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So when you're on the path to the Roman road, the first thing you need to recognize is that you're a sinner. We're sinners, yeah. There's a holy God and we don't line up with that standard. That's right. No one that's is right. righteous. You, you've, you've rebelled against God's commandments and you're a sinner. If you don't realize that, you can't be saved. <laughs> right. right. So we confess our sins. That's the first step on the Roman road. Right. So let's zoom in on uh, marker two here. This is Romans 6.23 and it's the wages of sin is death. So. Okay, you recognize you're a sinner, but there's a there's an outcome because you're a sinner. Uh, the right. wages of sin is death. It's now not I know just, that the consequence of that sin is going to lead us to eternal separation from God. Right, and there's a place called the lake of fire where lost people will will remain in torment forever. That's what the Bible clearly states, and so it's not just a physical death; uh, it's a spiritual death as well. Yep. We're heading towards death. We're all going to die. Um, two types of death, actually, um, unless okay. Uh, let's zoom in on the third road, uh, third marker here on the road, and that's Romans 5.8. And it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So there's, there's a way we can be saved. Uh, Jesus actually paid the penalty for those who trust and accept him as their Lord and Savior. Uh, somebody had to pay the price for, for our sin, and Jesus did it. Yeah, God we're in, just building in, in the thought flesh. upon thought here. That's, that's the way right. the Romans road goes. Yep. And we continue on, take a close up look at this marker, Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I mean, this is, this is totally by, by grace. This is nothing you don't have to work for. It's given to you freely by faith. Um, yeah, it's, it's different than just about every other religion out there. It's not by works, it's by faith, it's by the grace of God. Right, you, you just, you realize you're a sinner. There's a penalty for that. And Christ died, he paid the penalty for your sins. If you just confess that and believe it in your heart, then you're, you can actually be yeah. regenerated. And of course, uh, you can get the ultimate treasure, like the kingdom of heaven. And uh, what's it going to be like? Well, we read in Revelation 21.4, it says there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. I mean, we live in a world right now that's, that's got a lot of that going on. So this really sure. is yeah. like the, the greatest treasure you could, you could ever find, okay? 
So uh, we've got a complete uh, picture here, at least for this this part of the, the map. Of the yeah, and ma many viewers, I'm sure, will be familiar with that. We've heard these verses before. They're very common. That's right. Yeah. Now, it's interesting, though. We look, at around, look around our culture here, especially in the Western world countries, and we see the remnant of Christianity. I mean, look at, you know, things like weddings, and we, we celebrate Christmas and Easter, and you look at some of the architecture, and you see some of the, even the TV programs and stuff, and there's a remnant of Christianity sure. embedded yeah. in our culture. But for some reason, this, this path to the Roman road seems to be rejected more and more yes. and more yes. now. And so what we want to do is take a look at, at why that may be so. Is there a lost path leading up to this Roman road that we need to re-examine? So we're going to look at that in detail. In his second letter, the Apostle Peter links Jesus' second coming and judgment of the whole world to the historical reality of Noah's flood. He prophesied, In the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And Genesis is clear, the words all, every, everything and entire are used eight times in chapter 7 to describe what was covered or destroyed by the flood. Genesis 7.23 says every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. In the same way the flood was real and global, so too will the second coming of Jesus be real and the whole world be judged. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Now, having laid out the basics of the Roman road, again, that most of you are probably familiar with, there are some questions that arise out of those, those very basic four points that we just laid out. Uh, some questions arise. If all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God as, as the, our first marker in the Romans road, well, we could ask, what is sin? Where did, where did sin come from? Wait. Number two, the wages of sin is death in Romans 6.23. Well, we could ask, well, if the punishment for sin is death, when did death enter into the world? What, what, what is death? How do we understand death? And when did it come? And when did it come? Marker three, the gift of God is eternal life. And, but, and we could ask, how did Jesus' death pay for sin? Could he not have performed some ritual to absolve us all of our sins? Why, is, why was death needed? The fourth marker, if you confess Jesus as Lord, you shall be saved. Well, we could ask, why do I need to be saved? Saved from what? Right. Why, why am I, what am I being saved from? I mean, these are questions that will actually come up if you're trying to lead someone down that Roman road. Sometimes sure. they'll, they'll ask the basics, questions. And then, and then you go deeper with right. these questions, absolutely. So, I mean, when Jesus was, uh, it, it, all these questions really center around the, the death and the resurrection of Christ. When yes, you, when you the really central think about teachings, it. the central focus of all of That's history, right. actually. Now, when Jesus was teaching about um, a resurrection, and of course, Jesus quoted the Old Testament all the time. That was the scripture Thus in saith Jesus' the Lord. time. That's yes. what he was, he yes. was quoting. And so he talked about a resurrection. You remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? And of course, yes. the rich man, right. you know, he died. He went to a bad place, and Lazarus went to the good place. And, uh, and the, 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 you know, the, the rich man, he wanted to get out of, out of hell, but he couldn't. And so he said, well, send someone back and tell my, my brothers about it. I don't want them to suffer the same fate. And the, the response was, well, they've got Moses and the prophets. And if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not even going to believe it if a man rises from the dead. Yeah. They're not even going to believe someone comes back to life. They've got enough information in the scriptures, the Old Testament, right. to know what they need to do to be saved. And that's right. And uh, John 5, 46 and 47, Jesus, you know, after kind of tearing a strip off the Pharisees there, he said, his summary statement to them was, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? I mean, obviously the teachings of Moses was pretty important to Jesus and, and uh, about explaining, you know, if you don't believe what Moses wrote, which begs the question, of course, what did Moses write? And why is that important? Sure. Well, you look at the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and you can start to get some information uh, about how you're going to answer these, these questions that have come up from our, our Roman road journey. And so here we have the other half of the map, so to speak. Yeah, hence the title, The Lost uh, yeah. Path of the Roman Road. This is what we're saying is this is the lost path that That's needs right. to be recovered here. When you read the books of Moses, it starts off, and of course it starts in Genesis, and, and God creates the world, and at the end of his creation, everything's very good. Right? There's no death, there's no sin, there's no suffering, there's no bloodshed. Um, Genesis 1, 29 and 30 says, even the animals 
are eating plants. So there's no bloodshed or death yeah, or anything like that. You didn't like worry that. about your kids being ripped up by wild animals <laughs> or, or bitten by poisonous snakes. It was a very good world. Right. We continue down this, uh, this path here. We get to the fall. Of course, we don't live in that world anymore. So the Bible talks right. about the fact that the first man, Adam, sinned against God. God said, don't eat the fruit on that tree over there. He did. God said, because the day you do, dying you will die. A physical death as well as a spiritual separation from Both. God. Yes. We know what happened. The fall of man occurred. And uh, of course we read in Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So well, the New Testament is backing this up, of That's course. That's why we're all sinners, because we all go back to Adam, right. everybody on earth. So uh, we keep reading the books of Moses. You come across uh, this, this concept of a world judgment. Of course, we read that in Romans, uh, or sorry, in Genesis 6 to 9, right? Uh, the, the flood. The global flood, right. right? And it talks about a global flood that destroys the, the, the entire planet. And this is like the judgment to come, right? And this is a global event. It's not just a, a local right. event. We Everyone's read that the, affected. the highest mountains yep. under the entire heavens were covered, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a global judgment. And then, uh, of course, we keep going down the path and we get where God actually gives uh, his people the law. Now, that was specifically given to the Israelites, but in a big picture sense, the law is the difference between right and wrong. There are moral absolutes emanating from who God is that have always been in place. Don't murder, right. don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. And so, of course, when you uh, understand the real reason why the, the law was given, uh, the Apostle Paul says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. So the fact is, once you know you're a sinner, you need a savior, and then you can answer these questions that we're ta we've talked about right. here. Yeah. So we'll... Uh, We'll be able to answer those questions. So as soon as we get back, we can look at those things that came from the Roman road. Now we've looked at the beginning and we'll give answers to those right. questions. Yep. The reason that the Creation Answers book is so popular is because it covers a huge range of topics and answers more than 60 of the most asked questions about Genesis and the creation evolution issue. Questions like, what is the evidence for God's existence? Could the days in Genesis 1 be long periods of time? How did all the animals fit on Noah's Ark? Does radioisotope dating prove that the Earth is very old? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And many more. To order your copy, visit creation.com. Okay, uh, having looked at the first part of the, the map there, the lost path that leads to the Roman road, we can answer those questions that we had earlier. Right. What is sin and where did it come from? Well, sin is disobedience to God's laws and it came from Adam's disobedience. Um, if the punishment for sin is death, when did death enter into the world? Well, it, it entered into the world at the time of the fall. There was no death before Adam sinned. Um, how did Jesus pay a death pay for sin? Well, it was a substitutionary act. He, he, right. he stood in our place and took the punishment that we deserve. Um, and why do I need to be saved? Well, what are you going to be saved from? You need to be saved from the consequences of your actions against God. You're a sinner. You've offended a holy God. And he's going to judge everyone in his righteousness. Um, and so if you're, yes. not, if you're not clothed in, in Christ's righteousness, um, you're going to have to yeah. pay the penalty for that sin. God is perfectly loving. He's also perfectly just. He yep. can't allow criminals to go off scot-free. Right. Somebody needs to pay, and in this case, Christ paid the price. So you can see that our origins are critical for us to understanding right. uh, the, the Roman road, but it's interesting in our culture today. Uh, our culture seems to have rejected Christianity. I mean, we look at uh, you know TV shows like A Good Christian, well, uh, you can't say the last yeah. word here. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it's just highly offensive to, to see things like that uh, in our media. Uh, we see the rise of atheism all over the place, right? Here's a, a picture from uh, the famous bus campaign that Richard Dawkins uh, initiated, of course, in England and now in Canada. There's probably no God, so stop worrying and, and, and enjoy your life, right? And, and really, we gotta understand, where did atheism, why is atheism on, on the rise? Here's an interesting quote from F. Sherwood Taylor. He said, what changed, it asked the question, what changed England into a pagan nation? England one time sending out so many missionaries oh, and course. such a great yes, Christian yes, nation. Such a great heritage. He said, I myself have little doubt that in England it was geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. Now many people be like, what does science have to do with our, our, our theology and, and belief in God, yeah, etc. I mean, we would certainly agree with that. Uh, I would agree with history, it. History, yeah. and you can see that there. Let's go through the atheist checklist. These are three okay. things that all atheists have to believe. All atheists have to believe in evolution, because you have to explain how you got here without God. So that's right. number one on your checklist. Naturalism of some type. Um, you have to believe in millions of years, because evolution couldn't take place quickly. That's called creation. So you have to believe in that if you're an atheist. <laughs> and of course, if you're an atheist, you don't believe that the Bible can be 
trusted as, you know, as plainly written, obviously it's not true, right? So um, atheism requires evolution. As a matter of fact, if you look up the Humanist Manifesto, you can see statements like this, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. It's right in their manifesto, right? Uh, they believe that, God, uh, that man is part of nature and he emerges as a part of a continuous process. So these millions of years, that's integral to being an atheist. So I, I think we can uh, take uh, Taylor at his, at his word there when you really think about atheism. Yeah, it's an attack on Christianity, an attack on the, the whole foundation of the Roman road. Right. So evolution is on a completely different path. It's kind of like a super highway that's you know, rammed down your throat <laughs> right. whenever hey, you go to school or whatever. Of course, it starts with a big bang, some kind of cosmic evolution, you know, some uh, uncaused explosion billions of years ago, and then you know, uh, sure. know, hydrogen yeah. starts to come together, and then galaxies, and then finally you've got Earth, which is a hot molten blob. That's geological evolution, right? Of course, right. part of that would be those layers that we, we see with the dead things in there. Millions of years and fossils and all that. First, you yes. need life, yeah. which would be chemical evolution, right? Non-living chemicals come together, form some kind of life form, onward, upward through natural selection, genetic mutation, we get biological evolution. One type turns into another, yep. and then culminating, of course, in ape-like creatures who get bigger brains, and here we are today. So human evolution, and if you keep following the path, uh, you know, the laws of thermodynamics say that uh, you know, entropy is going to kick in, and eventually uh, we just get to heat death. There's no more available energy, and that's it, right? We're done. Yeah. And that's taught as science. And so many people think that this is a science versus faith issue. Yes, yeah, that's so popular. Yeah. I mean, but it's, it, I mean, that's not it at all, of course. Yeah. It's based on two histories. There's two different histories there. You have either God created or we got here through millions of years. Um, and and there's, there's two types of science as well. That's right. I mean, there's, you, you've got that historical science where we can test if water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Well, that, well, that would be operational pressure, science, right? Or operational science, yes, yeah. that's right. And you have historical science. For example, how do you prove that Abraham Lincoln was once a president of the United States? There's no you, empirical scientific test you can do Scientifically, you can't do that. Right. So really, we're talking about the fact that creationists and evolutionists have the same facts and they interpret them differently according to their starting beliefs. But depending on which road you're traveling down, you're going to have to uh, pick how you're going to interpret the evidence. Right. Which is yeah. what we're really going to get into uh, and what we, we talk about a lot in Creation Ministries and show you how you can interpret uh, the same evidence according to what God's Word says. Imagine hearing that someone has just won the lottery three times in the same year or a golfer has hit five consecutive holes in one. We approach such improbable stories with healthy skepticism. Considering the formation of the first living cell by a perfect arrangement of carbohydrates, fats, proteins and genetic material in a warm pond, Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick said, it seems almost impossible to give any numerical value to the probability of what seems a rather unlikely sequence of events. An honest man could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. The evolutionist Robert Shapiro at this point would prefer to abandon all skepticism. Why need the event have been probable? We can just stare at the odds, shrug and note with thanks how lucky we were. When we abandon healthy skepticism, only gullibility remains to invoke miracles without God. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Now, having talked a little bit about evolution and how this figures into this lost path of the Roman road, there's Christians out there saying, look, why are you guys talking about evolution? Why do you have all these scientists on board at CMI? Yeah. And, and you're, you're arguing creation versus evolution. It's all about Jesus. That's right. Just tell people about Jesus. We're, never mind about this scientific stuff. This science stuff, stuff doesn't, doesn't yeah. affect our faith, right? Well, let, let me introduce you to a concept called universal acid. I mean, if you can okay. picture what a universal <laughs> acid would be, it would be an acid that would eat through anything. You couldn't contain it in any beaker or anything like that. And this concept was talked about by Daniel Dennett, who's an atheist. Okay. And so basically, you know, when, when you look at Dennett, he's saying that, well, it's a liquid so corrosive it'd eat through anything. Basically, after universal acid was created and just, you know, spread throughout our society or anywhere, um, you'd see the remnants of, of what we, we, we once had, but everything would be transformed. And he says, what would the world look like? Right. And he says this, little did I realize that in a, very, in a few years, I would encounter an idea, Darwin's idea, bearing an unmistakable likeness to universal acid. Right. It eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview with, the most, with most of the old landmarks still recognizable but transformed in fundamental ways. Right. So let's think about this concept of universal acid and let's apply that to our 
uh, treasure map oh boy. here. Okay. And, and let's start off with theology. I mean, that should be important to the Christian, right? Now, if you've got this concept of millions of years, if you accept evolution, you try to apply that to the Christian worldview, then um, where are you going to put the millions of years? I mean, most Christians don't want to add millions of years after Adam and Eve because then you've got that chronology built sure, up there. Yeah, yeah. So many Christians have tried to say, well, in the six days of creation, you see on the screen here, you know, God created in six days and rested on the seventh. So here's six days. Where are you going to put the millions of years? Some people say, well, there's a gap between Genesis 1 and 1, 2. There's a gap theory. You just throw all the millions of years and the dinosaurs and all that stuff there. Um, um, of course, the most popular one now is you, you spread out the millions of years over the six days of creation. God's days are not like our days and, and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. But if you remember uh, Romans 5.12, it says that sin came through one man, uh, Adam, and death through sin. And there was no death before sin. Uh, and again, I remind people, this is talking about uh, people, uh, but Genesis yeah, 1, 29 and 30 says, in the beginning, everything was eating plants. And if those millions of years are true and you put them before, chronologically, before Adam even comes on the scene, then, you know, millions of years, those days aren't real, Sure. then you, you get at the end of God's creation, there's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, everything is very good according to God's word, but they're sitting on a bone pile and it's like miles deep. <laughs> right, and the what fossil the, record which is apparently millions of years old, which right. means it would have been there already at this point in biblical history, which and, doesn't and make any sense. It records death, it records suffering, there's cancers in the fossil record, disease, all that type of stuff. So all of a sudden we've got death before sin. And that's a huge problem. Right. This, is, this corrosive acid here is starting to affect our theology. Yeah. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Well, that can't be true because it was death before uh, sin, right? Romans 5.12, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. I mean, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Yeah, physical death and the forgiveness of sin tied together there. Right. What would the that's shedding of blood have to do with... If, yeah. It doesn't make sense. Right. So now we're looking at our, our theology here and the fall no longer makes sense. Well, if the fall doesn't make sense, then what, does, what did Jesus actually do? And it's interesting that atheists have picked up on this. Yeah. For example, here, here's a Darwin historian, Peter Bowler. He's very anti-Christian, anti-creationist, etc. And he said, if Christians accept that our uh, humanity was the product of evolution, even assuming the process could be seen as an expression of the Creator's will, then the whole idea of original sin would have to be reinterpreted. See, he's picked up on this. Right. Far from falling from an original state of grace, in the Garden of Eden, we have risen gradually from our animal origins. And if there was no sin from which we needed salvation, what was the purpose of Christ's agony on the cross? I mean, here's a Christ, uh, uh, an anti-Christian, here's an atheist. He's picked up on this very simply. Yeah. Christ became merely the perfect man who showed us what we could all hope to become when evolution finished its upward course. Amazing. And a lot of Christians are, are adopting that. They're saying, well, no, we don't need to take Genesis as real history. Right. There was sin and death and millions of years in Genesis. Yeah, no problem there. It's, it's interesting that the historians and the non-Christians have, have, are basically telling Christians, like you saw in Peter Bowler's uh, statement here, that you can't do that. Right. Christians, you have to take Genesis as real history. We don't have a choice here. That's right. So this concept that evolution doesn't affect our faith, uh, this universal acid, we're actually going to explore that a little more and see what else it affects. Creation Magazine is a 56-page full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. Okay, now we're just talking about this concept of this universal acid, right. millions of years in evolution, that, that eats away at Christian theology back yeah. uh, in Genesis and the foundation for the lost Roman road. What else does it eat away at? Right, atheist Daniel Dennett said it would affect everything. So let's, let's try morality. Okay. That's just that concept. Well, uh, let's go to an atheist who is a, a Darwinist. That's what uh, Dennett said universal acid was like. Here's P.Z. Myers. And uh, doing a talk at a university, he said, first, there is no moral law. The universe is a nasty, heartless place where most things wouldn't mind killing you if you let them. No one is compelled to be nice. You or anyone could go on a murder spree, and all that is stopping you is your own self-interest. So, according to the atheists, 
There is no moral law, which this is completely logical, by the way. If yes, there is no there God, if there is no moral lawgiver, you don't have a moral law or a basis for a moral law. That's right. So there is no moral law in this worldview. Now, let's keep pouring some acid over this here. How about the concept of the sanctity of life? I mean, obviously, the abortion issue is a huge uh, uh, issue that most evangelicals are, are trying to fight against because it, it's got, created in God's image. We're not to kill, uh, kill um, right. people. Yeah. But um, here was a, a new paper, very recent came out in the Journal of Medical Ethics, and the title was After Birth Abortion, Why Should the Baby Live? And they said abortion is largely accepted even for reasons that do not have anything to do with the fetus's health um, by showing that one, both fetuses and newborns do not have the same moral status as actual persons. Two, the fact that both are potential persons is morally irrelevant. And three, adoption is not always the, in the best interest of actual people. The authors argue that what we uh, what we call afterbirth abortion, killing a newborn, should be permissible in all cases where abortion is including cases where the newborn is not disabled. So now you don't kill the baby just in the womb. The baby's born and you kill them after. And they didn't say when that may extend, extend to. Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it two years? Yeah. Is it five years? 20 years, 60 years. Exactly. Yeah. So um, the sanctity of life is out the window here. Um, how about biblical authority? Right, the the fact that uh, you know we should just stand on the word of God, et cetera, et cetera. Well, here's another uh, atheist's uh, viewpoint. Here is Richard Dawkins, and he said, "It seems to me an odd proposition that we should adhere to some parts of the Bible story, but not to others. After all, when it comes to important moral questions, by what standards do we cherry pick the Bible? Why bother with the Bible at all if we have the ability to pick and choose from it what is right and what is wrong?" Well, he's being logical. That's again. right. It's just logical. And we would, we would agree with that to yep. someone. We're not atheists, obviously, but we would say it's all or nothing. That's right. If you're not going to accept the, the, the God's Word in one area in Genesis, why would you accept it somewhere else? And yep. he's being logical. How about just the concept of the belief in God? And let's pour some acid on that. <laughs> this is an atheist. Um, uh, uh, and, and he said, I think he summed it up perfectly. He said, the theory of evolution demolishes the best reason uh, anyone has ever suggested for believing in a divine creator. This does not demonstrate that there is no divine creator, of course, but it only shows that if there is one, he needn't have bothered to create anything since natural selection would have taken care of it anyway. See, he's pointing out that if this naturalistic uh, worldview is true, um, you don't really need God. So belief in God, right. uh, that's out the, out the window. So when we, we see how much this universal acid has been applied to our Christian worldview, we look back in creation, I mean, most people see creation as just this ancient, decrepit notion. Uh, we need to get with the times. Science is, is, is what we need to, you know, we want to be intellectual Christians, right. et cetera, et cetera. They call science really interpretation right. but, of certain evidences. But really, you're not being intellectually sound at all because now you can't defend the Bible logically. So we need to get back to creation, understand that path, clear it up and get people on the road to salvation.